Y'all, I am fired up. Am, am I too loud? Because I am. I'm pretty pumped up to do this. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Do we have any fans of cocktails in the audience? Do we have any fans of bad jokes in the audience? Yes. Y'all are my kind of crowd. I have a hand-lettered margarita bandana that can be yours if you can guess the punchline to my opening bad joke. Why do we make cheap dates? Anybody? Shout them out. <laughs> I, I don't understand that punchline, but we could talk about it over drinks afterward. <laughs> Anybody else? Just burning a hole in my pocket. We can get drunk just looking at the bottle, Xerxes, you win a bandana. <laughs> you win a bandana. All right. <clears throat> My name is Matthew Wine. I am a graphic designer, cocktail maker, drinks writer, and very serious when I shake a drink. And this is my magnum opus, Letters and Liquor, where I have gone back and done research on how spirits and drinks were advertised so that I can hand letter the name of uh, 52 drinks that changed our definition of the cocktail in a period-inspired style. We are all familiar with typographic eras. Cocktails also have eras. I can't do 52 drinks in 20 minutes, so we are going to do one drink from each period. And because uh, lettering is often very expressive when advertising alcohol, we will also be looking at design eras to give us some more perspective. So let's get started. Uh, our first period in cocktails is called the Archaic Period, and while you will see that typographically the transitional thing is happening, and in design, the Rococo thing is happening. None of those things are happening in the US because it's not even the United States yet. We are still the colonies, and things are kind of backwoods in most parts of those colonies. Uh, this illustration was inspired by the kind of copper plate engraving that you would have in a cookbook, for example. So we've got some engraver's script, some engraver's type. The flip is a very early style of mixology. Uh, because we are not yet a country, folks are going out and they are chopping trees, hauling rocks. They are not wealthy enough to afford the refined cognacs, for example, that you might be able to import from France. So booze is rough, people are rough, and uh, when they sit down for a drink in the evening, that is a, a viable source of calories which they really need. The flip is made with rum, egg, raw egg, sugar, uh, some nutmeg, and then you add beer to it, and that beer would be flavored with spruce tips. We were not yet growing hops. To flip it, you take a hot poker from a fireplace, plunge it into the tankard until it bubbles, boils, and froths over the top. And I have made this by leaving the handle of a cast iron pan in a gas flame for 15 minutes. I was terrified. <laughs> they are delicious. It's a cool way to mix a drink if you have a lot of uh, armor-clad friends at your apartment. <laughs> to do research for this period, I went to Colonial Williamsburg in Virginia where they have uh, recreated the way life was in the colonies. And as you can see, signs are primarily pictographic because there were a lot of people who could not read at this point. Uh, the type or hand-painted lettering that you do see was often inspired by Caslon. Uh, the first printed version of the Declaration of Independence was printed in Caslon. And so, to create the illustration for the flip, I looked through a book called Old Tavern Signs. Somebody collected this and wrote a masterful thesis about it. We've got this beautiful shape here, four different parts to that, five different parts to that, and uh, primarily, again, pictographic, whetting your appetite with that magical moment when your flip flips over so that you can't wait to rush into the tavern and have a drink. We now move to the Baroque period of American mixology. A lot of cool things happening in typography. Uh, the didone is swiftly followed by the slab serif, almost opposite ways of approaching 
typography, and then uh, very expressive things happening in the Romantic and Victorian eras in design. So as you can see, uh, things are getting a lot more um, complex, a lot more evocative in terms of lettering. We have all these lovely spurs coming off the letters in Baroque. Uh, we also have a sans serif. William Caslon's son cuts a sans serif around 1820 that he releases in a specimen book. And plenty of decoration here, which is appropriate for the drinks because now that the United States is a flourishing country, we have a lot of people who are new money. And new money people like to show off. You could show off by uh, importing fancy spirits like sherry from Spain. You could also show off by putting that sherry in a fancy cut crystal glass and then topping it with some very expensive fruits and mint to show that you were wealthy. And uh, the sherry cobbler is delicious. I highly recommend you having one. You use a medium dry sherry, you add a spoonful of sugar and some, uh, some orange, and then you throw it back and forth between two shakers with small lumps of ice, as they called it, and those lumps were also called cobbles, which is how the drink gets its name. In looking for inspiration from the Baroque period, we've got some uh, Simon Fournier, Jean-Francois, did I pronounce that correctly? Uh, this beautiful decorative border. We've got some, uh, if you look over at Mart Ackerman's saloon, you can see the Didone influence. You also see that heavily decorative uh, saloon lettering there in the middle. And finally, in the bottom, I found a menu that had prices on cobblers. They were 12 and a half cents. They are now 12 and a half dollars. As you can see, I was pretty literal with this one. I think I was running out of time. Uh, there is an anachronism here. In the spirit of California's farm to table movement, I have indicated the origins of all of my ingredients on that particular drink. We are now going to move to the classic period of mixology, which is where you get all the famous cocktails that everyone knows and loves, like our martinis, our Manhattans. Uh, even more fun things happening in the design period with the introduction of Art Nouveau. And so as you can see, I have chosen a much more expressive style here. And this is drawn from uh, advertising that you would see for vermouth, because vermouth is common both to the Martini and the Manhattan, and it was a big catalyst for changing the style of drinks. The illustration in the bottom is Wormwood. Wormwood was so named because it would drive worms out of the body. Wonderful thing to think about when you're having a drink. And up top we have some grapes, the base for vermouth. The Martinez is actually the predecessor to the Martini, and it is kind of a hybrid between the Martini and the Manhattan, being that it has a gin base but uses sweet vermouth. Uh, Martini now uh, uses dry vermouth. Now we can see that the garnish is less gaudy because gaudy became gauche. Uh, we still have some fancy glassware, uh, but the <clears throat> presentation has been restrained a little bit because new money has gone to old money, and old money does not want to show off as much. We also get the transition, which is similar uh, to the reduction in ornament. We also get a reduction in sweet, which is how the Martinez goes from being a sweet drink to the dry martini. And in doing research for this piece, I started looking at labels for Old Tom Gin. Old Tom Gin is a style that predates London Dry Gin. It was a sweeter style of gin. And we see this fat slab serif to match the fat Tom Cat we have sitting on that barrel. Uh, I noted in particular this beautiful Tuscan over here on the right hand side. Uh, also has a high contrast to it so we can see our typographic developments being expressed in these labels. Uh, the acanthus leaf here, while it is florid and expressive, it still has more of an old money uh, family crest kind of feel than the earlier more expressive work. Prohibition changed drinking dramatically. Up until Prohibition, cocktails had been primarily an American phenomenon. And after Prohibition, uh, America's bartenders went to Europe to practice their trade, mainly London, especially Paris. 
and wealthy Americans would go visit those bartenders in London and Paris to do their drinking. And this is where, uh, in America, we have a lot of signs like these, uh, just classic sign painters' sands. Uh, all this language is verbatim. I took this directly from signs. If John Downer is here, he can tell me all the mistakes that I made in my sign painter's lettering. The French 75. I will never look at this drink the same after doing my research. Uh, it is named after a piece of artillery that was used to devastating effect in World War I, and it's, it's heartbreaking to read about it but it was so named because it has not one, but two alcoholic elements, both gin and champagne. Uh, American whiskey is going to lose a lot of ground at this point. It had made great strides, culminating in the creation of the Manhattan, but after prohibition, uh, American whiskey can only be made medicinally, and accordingly, uh, whiskey fell off and gin swept in to take its place. We see in Europe at this time the full flourishing of Art Nouveau used frequently to advertise food and drink products. Uh, while I am absolutely infatuated with the work of Alphonse Mucha, for example, I have a confession to make. The lettering that I chose is not accurate to the style because I don't think his lettering matched uh, his other design work, his flourishes and such. I would describe a lot of Mucha's lettering as being balloon lettering, and it just didn't have that same flowing quality. So this is a little bit more Victorian, the treatment that I've chosen here. We will talk about Victorian lettering, or excuse me, balloon lettering in a minute with a later drink. The next period I am calling the war years, uh, World War I, World War II, and then the aftermath of World War II changes American culture dramatically. You will note that I have not highlighted any design errors here, and we will soon see why. Uh, this illustration borrows a lot from movie titles of the period. We've got some Palatino, I believe. We've got some Cabell, and then we have this wonderful, I don't know if it's like a wedge serif that becomes a sand serif that becomes a wedge serif, but it's super fun. I loved that style when I found it, and it was really fun to recreate some letters that I did not have examples for. The zombie was the first famous tiki cocktail. Now, we don't have any whiskey because of the war effort, and that continues for quite some time, because even after prohibition is lifted, uh, we soon get into World War II, and the government tells distillers you have to switch over to producing fuel alcohol. Now, if you're making something like gin, you distill it, you put it in a bottle, you sell it the next day. If you're making whiskey, you distill it, you put it in a barrel, and you have to wait for at least two years. So it was difficult for whiskey to keep up, and as a result, rum, which had been made very cheaply in the Caribbean continuously, was in ready supply, and affordable for bartenders. War, as devastating as it is, uh, left the American people with a need for escape, and tiki was the answer to that escape. We see a lot of Polynesian influence in the movies of the time, uh, movies that are set in the South Seas that are full of these escapist fantasies. And Don the Beachcomber, who created the zombie cocktail, which I'm not sure on the exact recipe because it's so complicated, but three different rums, probably two different kinds of citrus, uh, multiple sweeteners, whether they be honey or maple syrup, and then he would throw in a dash of spice and a splash of absinthe to get a really incredibly rich kind of flavor. So as you can see, the lettering that we have here adheres to this fantasy that we are on an island and just using what we have available like bamboo to create our signage. And uh, I was able to channel this overall feeling into a sign that uses driftwood. I didn't want to copy the whole bamboo thing, uh, but it's a very evocative, you see a lot of watercolor painting to get that gauzy, nostalgic kind of feel which is a real antidote to the higher speed of life and the trauma of war that Americans were experiencing. 
We have now reached the speakeasy portion of my presentation. I have not shared any of these. So feel free to take pictures, but please don't post them on the internet because I don't want to ruin the surprise for all the people who are following along at home. The dark ages of the cocktail are the period when the craft goes out of cocktails. And this happens with the rise of disco and Studio 54. Uh, we have some avant-garde here by Herb Lou Ballin, who was wise enough to hire Louise Feely. Uh, the Harvey Wallbanger is essentially a screwdriver with the addition of a fancy Italian liqueur called Galliano. And this is the period when drugs are the cool thing to do, not cocktails. Uh, so they have gone from being a craft thing to being something that is a lot more fun. Uh, drinks get a whole lot sweeter. We've now come full circle. We went from sweet to dry. Now we're going from dry back to sweet. And this is really where we see the full flowering of brands using a cocktail as a means to advertise their product. This is Harvey Wallbanger. He is a marketing campaign and not a very handsome one at that. I have no idea why this image inspired people to drink stuff, but sales of Galliano shot up incredibly after this campaign came out. And uh, I told you we were going to talk about balloon lettering. I think the letters in the Harvey Wallbanger campaign have a closer relationship to Alphonse Mucha's letter forms than he would like to admit. <laughs> so as you can see, we are channeling some psychedelic energy here. Uh, it's all about fun and color. It's very cartoon-like. A far, far cry from those refined letter forms and design shapes that we saw earlier. We have come now to the cocktail revival, which we are still enjoying the fruits of today. And it is paired with uh, desktop publishing, changing the way graphic design is done, and for good reason. Uh, the cocktail aficionados that were able to use the internet to start connecting with each other were a big part of accelerating cocktail knowledge and building an audience for bartenders who wanted to reintroduce craft to the cocktail. So as you can see from this illustration, we have a wide range of typographic styles that the computer made available to graphic designers. You could start pulling from all these different eras and combining things that would not have been combined together in the past to create something new from the past. The drink that I am featuring here was invented like 10 blocks from where we are. The barrel-aged Negroni was created by bartender Jeffrey Morgenthaler at Clyde Common, which is in the Ace Hotel on 10th and Stark. And I visited him on Thursday. He is a cool dude. Uh, very gracious. When I uh, sent him a message on Instagram telling him about the project, he was very welcoming. And uh, I highly encourage you to go out to Clyde Common. Great bar. I had a great time. The cocktail revival started frequently with bartenders taking old drinks like the Negroni, which comes to around 1934, and putting a new twist. We talked about whiskey needing two years in a wood barrel to mature. Well, Jeff got the idea to take a fully made cocktail and put it in a small tabletop wood barrel for two months. And the drink that he got out of it had a lot more subtlety and complexity because those ingredients at a molecular level got to hang out and get to know each other and you get a little bit more wood influence. This became a trend. You can find barrel-aged cocktails now at bars around the world. And it also turned Jeff into a star. He has two books out. He has been featured on the Seth Meyers show where he almost set Seth on fire. This is the menu for Clyde Common. And again, we've got a very eclectic set of fonts here. Uh, we've got our, uh, our sans serif, and then we've got a script, and then we've got this typewriter font, not things that you would have seen combined in previous eras. And so I used the illustration style. You didn't see it previously, but they have an illustration style that they use on their coasters, for example. Uh, I was especially happy to be able to use Philosophia by Amigre, because again, that is taking something old, like Bodoni's types, and uh, recreating it in a, a new way for that period. There are many, many more of these illustrations on my blog and on my Instagram account. Please 
Come join us as we go through the Dark Ages and the Cocktail Revival. And if you would like any bar recommendations, I've been to like eight of them in three days. So I'm <laughs> happy to tell you about them. Thanks very much.